Praise God and welcome back to Grace Online. I'm Pastor Lachey, excited about the close of this year. We're only a few short days away um, to looking at a new year. 2024 is upon us. It's amazing how quick the year has gone and how many episodes or how many broadcasts that we've had an opportunity to present to you this year alone. And as I think back over the content, there has been some pretty valuable deposits being made in the body of Christ as it relates to messages and series, interviews with guests, topics and subjects from the start of this year till now. I believe that we've been putting in some work and I appreciate you uh, viewing. I appreciate you sharing, liking this, subscribing to the channel, and there'll be some more things coming in 2024. I think when we started Going online, when we, when we uh, first initially went online, we had quite a bit of uh, content in different formats. And this seems to be, based on feedback, one of the uh, mainstays, something that is common among us, is that at 10 o'clock on Sundays, there's going to be a fresh um, post of a message, a devotional of sorts like this. Short, brief, to the point, but hopefully impactful. If we've in any way been a blessing to you, I'm praying that you would do something to communicate back to us, that you would send us a, a text or that you would put something in the comments, perhaps maybe even email us or go to our website, get the email address, drop a message saying, hey, thank you for this. Not so much to give accolades, but as much to uh, let us know that you are receiving from these various messages. And if you'd like to support this ministry in any way financially, you feel free to do so as well. It does cost to have these resources that we're making available to you. It, there's some expenses involved. And so we wanna make sure that uh, we are able to continue to do that and increase also the quality of the programming that comes your way. Some exciting things heading toward you in 2024 from Grace for the Nation's Church. I wanna get into this message. We, still, uh, we're, we are still discussing a focus, um, I hesitate to to call them series just in case we break it up, but this is um, another conversation centered around the discussion that we started at the beginning of the month of December on maintaining the change, maintaining the change. And I want to encourage you to think about this. We're going to pray, but think about how important it is to dissect that statement of maintaining change. It almost appears to be an oxymoron, but we need to maintain the process of growing developing and changing in order to not only receive what God has for us, but also to be able to produce what God intended for us to produce, which requires change. Let's pray. Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for time in your word. Thank you for those who are tuning in and those who are supporting ministry here at Grace for the Nation's Church. We appreciate every opportunity to share the word, the light and the life of the gospel to someone who needs to hear, someone who is interested in hearing, and someone who's more than willing to eat this, digest this, and produce it in someone else's life. So I pray blessings upon those who are viewing at any time they're watching, in Jesus' name, amen. We started out with um, scripture uh, foundationally in the book of Ephesians, and um, the challenge was relating to us learning how to maintain the process of change and growth. Because we're closing out a year and we've gone through various seasons in this year, I want you to take a minute to do a self-reflection on how much you have changed, how much growth can you attribute to your studying, your reading the word, your disciplines in Christian discipleship. As Christians, we're being discipled, but we're also told and mandated and obligated to disciple others. And that could be an assessment right there. Who have you discipled or who have you poured into since you have come to grips with or acknowledged your own Christianity? And I don't, I'm not talking about who you've invited to church. And I'm not talking about um, who you went to a church service with. I'm talking about the dynamic of a relationship where we have stewarded or we have been responsible for helping someone else to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Somebody mentioned this and I, and I hesitated to repeat it because it was convicting that unless we are creating disciples, our Christianity is only part fulfilled. Which I, and I can't say that somebody's not saved because they are not discipling or they're not evangelizing or not sharing their faith, but those are part of the prerequisites of our relationship with God as dear sons and daughters of God is that we are telling others how to become dear sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. And so I'm challenging you as we are studying this concept of maintaining change. The transformation process is not just if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, but it's what have you done since you've become new and how are you creating others 
or helping others to create that new relationship with God as well. We all must be born again, and we all need to confess Jesus as our Savior. But we also know that we've been given certain things, and we talked about stewardship a few series back, and being stewards over what it is that God gave us. I think it was in October or, or, or November, well, October, because in November we talked about gratitude. And the, and the ultimate expression of gratitude is not just saying thanks, it's actually stewarding what we've been given and then also having a maintained relationship with the person or the, or the source in which we received from. So, so I'm challenging you to take this even a next step further and asking yourself the question, how am I maintaining the change process in my growth and development? We could assess it by just saying, how much fruit are you producing? But let's go even closer or deeper into the investigation of what type of fruit and does the fruit remain? And is it the fruit that is kingdom oriented? Or are we just simply more blessed because we now know how to tithe? Or are we blessed because we no longer do what we did before and our lives will be extended because we're not um, using those substances or living that lifestyle that we used to live? Think for a moment about how that's a benefit to you. But how does it benefit the kingdom of God? How does it benefit others that you're a Christian now, that you're saved now? So there's some challenge questions that um, I put at the end of each of these messages, um, and I'll share one today. But let's go back to the foundation scripture in Ephesians. And I believe it's the second chapter, Ephesians is the second chapter. And I think we were looking at um, verses one through four specifically. Um, but we may get into five, and then we're going to flip over to uh, 1 Corinthians as well. So in Ephesians, um, where we started in the foundation of this discussion, second chapter, it reads, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you used to walk when you conformed to the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the sons and daughters of disobedience. All of us also lived among them at one time, fulfilling the cravings of our flesh and indulging its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature the children of wrath. And then it goes on to say, but God who is rich in mercy, where he has shown his mercy toward us, has raised us up together to sit with Christ in heavenly places. And I'm paraphrasing various translations. One of the things I do is I open up multiple translations of the scripture so that I can make it more conversational or you can relate to the words that are being spoken as opposed to a King James or maybe an antiquated version of the Bible that gives us more historic confusion as opposed to application. So as we apply this, what's being said by Paul to the people at Ephesus is that we used to live a certain kind of way. And now that you have come into the knowledge of God's truth and you have a relationship with Jesus, you are no longer walking like the children of darkness in the disobedience or even conforming to the ways of this world. One of the letters he wrote um, or he's attributed to have written um, says that I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice um, holy and acceptable unto God and don't be conformed to the world or the world systems, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So since you have been transformed and since there is a renewal, where are we going and how, how far have we gotten? And if we never do that assessment and we're just good with being Christians, we're just good with being saved, we're just good with speaking in tongues every now and then, dancing our dance. We had a service last Sunday that just really, you know, moved in a whole different way because we've been seeking God at a deeper level for inner court experiences by first addressing the outer court, how we approach God. And, and that's a, another story for another day. But I, what I'm saying is that God is constantly moving us along the way and opportunities for growth are before us. But are we embracing those? And are we in some way utilizing the tools and the resources of the word of God, the fellowship of the saints, the gifts of the, of, in the body of Christ? Are we somehow utilizing that or becoming those things in order to maintain the change process? Because we're all going to be changed. I'm, I'm reminded of one scripture, and we, we use it in, in funerals all the time as an encouragement. It says that we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, but it's preceded by a series of, of statements that talk about those who are dead in Christ and that they are asleep and they will come alive at the, at the reckoning when Jesus comes back. The Bible says, and those who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And, and we, we quote those scriptures to encourage people about their loved one who's passed on, but we don't recognize the fact that we may be among those who are alive and remain. And the objective is to be called up to meet the Lord in the air and to be reconciled 
because this is what this is talking about, being reconciled with God based on the virtue of having lived a continuously changing life to become better in our faith, faith to faith and glory to glory, to become more mature in the depth of understanding the word or even the revelation and the knowledge of who Jesus is. I'll break it down and make it really, really simple. What have you done since you have come to know Jesus? What have you done since you've gotten saved and born again? And it can't be that I accepted Christ as a child or I was baptized when I was six, 12 or eight. And now, you know, I just know I'm, I'm, I'm covered. Covered by what? I can sign up for insurance policies all over the world or all over the United States, but unless I'm paying a premium somewhere, it does not matter unless I'm literally keeping up with the premium to pay into the insurance. And in this case, it's an assurance, blessed assurance, and we're not paying with monetary things. But there is a reconciliation. Is our, are our thoughts being renewed? Is our lifestyle changing? Or are we reverting back to the old ways? And our point of reference, and this is what's most excruciating for me, is that as Christians, our point of reference is becoming just the nostalgic things that we remember that make us feel good. When we first got saved, I remember they used to, and I remember the preacher used to, and the pastor would, or we would have altar calls that. And when people go back to those things, just nostalgically, it's, it's fine. It makes you feel good for a moment, but it does nothing in advancing your growth and development. And it's like me trying to remember the smell of, um, you know, baked fresh hot apple pie and, you know, steam on the windows at Christmas time because there was somebody that, that didn't happen. I mean, that would be nostalgic if I could make that up in my mind and relive that. But that's not the truth or the reality of a childhood experience. So even our early days as a Christian has to be taken with the grain of salt that we saw it through rosy colored glasses. We saw it through a euphoric experience. Of course, the world was a bigger, brighter, and better place when we first got saved because we came immediately out of darkness. Everything was really bright to us, and we needed a visor just to see. Now we've adjusted to the light and the darkness of this world, and we've become children of one or the other. And you can't do back and forth. You can't be a child of the light and child of darkness. You can't be a child of God and a child of this world and do the things of this world at the same time. And I don't, I don't care what anybody might say differently to try to negate the standards of God's righteousness and holiness. And I'm not speaking of a denomination. I'm not speaking of an affluent, historic, cultural denomination or a group of people that have taken the liberties to be arrogant about our holiness roots. When in actuality, everybody who is called by the name of the Lord should have roots steeped in holiness, godliness, and righteousness. And so if we cannot divorce ourselves from just the nostalgia of our identity as a club, or I'm wearing a label, Grace for the Nation's Church, what if I thought that was the only way to get saved? What if I was deceived enough to believe that if you don't come this way, you, you, you're not in the way? What if I was deceived to believe that God is only going to come through this portal as opposed to the fact that God is the God of this entire world and he's reaching people of every language, every kindred, every tongue, every nation of which everyone will bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. So I didn't get to the rest of these scriptures. I'm excited about this. There's another message in this series left. And so before we close out today, let me share this with you. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians really quickly. In 1 Corinthians, same author, different group of people that he's writing to, he says something to them that I think is essential in understanding that is important for us to reconcile change, to make the reconciliation between where we've come from and where we are. In fact, if we were to give this a title, I'd say making change and stewarding the difference. Making change and stewarding the difference. I used an analogy last uh, mess in the last uh, teaching or discussion about if I give you a denominational bill, a dollar, uh, a, a dollar bill, a ten dollar bill, and we purchase something, I purchase from you, and there's a difference between how much that costs, the value of it, and how much change I'm supposed to get. My expectation is that the denomination that I gave you, ten dollars, is going to be exchanged for the value or worth of what I'm purchasing, and that you'd give me the difference back which means that if I purchase something that's $5, I give you $10, I got $5 coming back. And I wanna make that real to you. I want you to think about the fact that Jesus gave his life, which of course paid the price and there's some change left over, but we were precious and we were valuable 
transactions that were transformed. We literally were worth more than gold and, and, and rubies and diamonds, according to scripture, silver and gold. We were worth more than those things when Jesus paid the price. But can you imagine what he was worth in that he was God's only begotten son and the most precious to him next to us? Meaning that when Jesus came to give his life, he came to reconcile or to exchange sin for righteousness, death for life, eternal damnation to eternity with God. And so that had to be worth something. And in that exchange, there was some change. There was something left over. What's left over? Well, I think what's left over is the years that we have still here on the planet. I think what's left over is the gifts and the talents that you have. I think what's left over is the dynamic of a relationship with a God who is real, who is alive, who lives inside of us through the Holy Spirit. And when we do something with that change left over, when we do something with it, it's not just for us to get a treat. I remember going to the store for Mrs. Page, who lived upstairs over my grandparents when I was a kid. She would call us upstairs to get money to go to the store to buy her a Pepsi, a bag of chips, and whatever else she wanted us. And she would give us the money, and she'd say, and here you can buy yourself something with the change. So I was calculating in my mind how much it was going to cost for me to buy whatever it was that she wanted me to buy, and then how much was going to be left so that I would know what I could get from the experience, the, the exchange, from the transaction. But Mrs. Page would not get up and go to the store herself. She would send us to the store, and as a result of it, we'd come back with the change and then have to go back to the store and buy us something. At least that's how I did it. I wouldn't take the liberties of buying something while I made her purchase because I wanted to make sure she knew that there was still some change left over. 50 cents went a long way in the 1970s and 80s. 50 cents went a long way. And so I can remember coming back with two quarters and she'd say, here, you can keep the two quarters, which is the change. And then she'd say, you know what? I appreciate you going to the store for me just around the corner. Mr. Davis's store. The market was right around the corner. I cut through the alley, hop over a fence, go get whatever it was. And then I'd bring back her two quarters. Sometimes she would say, thank you, I appreciate it so much. And she would take the two quarters and instead of giving me the two quarters to go back to the store, she'd give me a whole dollar, a whole dollar. Her stuff only cost a dollar and 50 cents. So she'd give me a dollar. I'm giving you the simplicity of this mathematical equation that when you serve, when you do something that is relevant to helping someone else, God multiplies really the difference or the change. So in essence, I'm saying you're not just being changed or saved just to be changed or saved. You're being changed or saved to make the world a better place and to do something different in the lives of other people by virtue of your life being different. I think about those grandbabies and I talk about them often that if one of them has had an experience in their diaper that needs to be changed, when they are changed, they're much happier. They're a little bit more active. In fact, they're probably looking for the opportunity to do the same thing they just did and get changed again. And that's how we are as, as babies in Christ. But then once we grow up and we mature, it's no longer acceptable for us to walk around with smelling objects. We literally have to release ourselves from doing those baby things and start taking care of ourselves in a way and even helping somebody else. So, so as I helped Mrs. Page by going to the store for her, I then in turn remembered that God blessed me, or in that day, I thought Ms. Page blessed me with, you know, the dollar. What has God given you as a result of you doing something? I'm still talking about stewardship. I'm talking about how we make change and steward the difference. What's the difference between what you used to do, years added to your life, and what it is that you identify as now, a believer, a Christian, a preacher, a teacher. It's somebody that needs to be encouraged to get up and do something with what you have. And I'm not talking about just trying to fit into the nostalgic realm of our religious experiences. I'm talking about making a difference that you don't have to preach about, brag about, or tell nobody about, but it shows up. You don't necessarily have to have a grand opening on social media to explain the fact that you responded to a call that's on your life. You're just simply going to do it, and as a result of it, we'll see the change. We will see, wow, she has really grown. He has really matured. And their lifestyle, their choices, their decisions, what they're exposing us to about their life shows that growth. It shows that maturity. Let me close with the scripture that I wanted to share with you. In 1 Corinthians, like I said, it's a different uh, group of people that he's writing to, but the same author. Paul is writing to them like he wrote to the Ephesians. So he says this in the fourth chapter, starting at the first verse. 
He says, this then is how you ought to regard us. And he's talking about how people related to him and those who were serving along with him, meaning how he's stewarding his gifts. He says, this is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God that he has revealed. Verse number two says, now it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful or a steward must be found faithful in another translation. You've been given a trust. You've been given something worth something, something that is inherited by us from God. And we must be faithful or we must be good stewards over that. Verse number three says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself for my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Verse five says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Don't judge anything. Don't don't count yourself out and don't call somebody else a hero that they're not. Watch the fruit. Look at the difference between their transformation and their transactions. Think for a moment about if I really been saved, then you're going to see saved come out of my life. Back to the scripture. He says, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord that judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motive of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise or reward from God. Now, you can read the rest of the fourth chapter of First Corinthians and you will find that the admonition or the encouragement is to be good stewards over what God has blessed us with in this new walk, to be a steward over our relationship with God through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm challenging you with the question, what have you done differently than when you first believed? And who are you impacting with what you have in this way of exchange? I'm a new man, so I am now doing these things. So take that challenge. Uh, next week, I'll finish up this series of this discussion. Um, topic with some exciting things about the greatest gift that has been given to us um, and how God truly, truly, truly changed the world when he sent his son Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time in your word and I thank you for even the zeal and excitement of your people who are responding to this call to dig into what it means to steward what you blessed us with in the way of our change. We've been changed. We've been called to the newness of life Therefore, we put off the old things of our past and we embrace the newness of our walk in Christ. I pray for somebody today who's sorting this all out, somebody who's making the decision to do better in 2024 and to do more as we progress, awaiting the Jesus' return that we often preach about. So our Father, I pray that someone would be saved and delivered before the end of this year. Family members that we've been praying for, individuals who used to know you coming back into a fellowship with you. Father, I pray that this is real for them. And we bless you, we honor you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. And if you are available to come and worship with us, we worship at one o'clock here at Grace for the Nation's Church, where we believe there is hope. On Christmas Eve, we will be having a candlelight service that you are welcome to come and attend. Um, we, we always invite the community to come and be a part of what's happening at Grace. But on the candlelight service, we're going to be honoring him as Christ our King here at Grace for the Nation's Church. God bless. Greetings and thank you for tuning in to Grace Online. Thank you for making this your place of virtual worship today. We're so glad that you decided to choose us. And speaking of choosing, I want to encourage you to choose Jesus today. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So maybe you're at a crossroads in your life and you feel like this is the day. I don't want to, I don't want to delay any, anymore. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. Today might be my last day. But while I have this chance, I'm going to choose Jesus. And if that's your decision, I want you to pray this prayer. In fact, you can repeat right after me and let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and I believe you sent him to die for my sins. I know I am a sinner. And today I confess that I want to be saved. God, I believe you sent your son 
I believe you also raised him from the dead to life. And I want to make the conscious decision to walk with Jesus from this day forward. I pray, God, that I will steward this season well. And I pray, oh God, that I will walk with clarity and I will walk with faith and I will walk believing that your son Jesus will never leave me or forsake me. And now, at this moment, I know that I am saved and I will live eternally through your help. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you again for choosing Grace. And if you prayed that prayer, send an email to info at gftnc.org and let us know your name, where you're from, and why you chose to follow Jesus today. We would love to get in touch with you. We would love to love on you, and we would love to hopefully see you one day here in the building at 3333 Craft. Thank you again, and here at Grace, we always say, we believe there is hope. God bless.